after a historic election. Thank you, everybody. I'll be the next U.S. Senator from Pennsylvania. It looks like the reports of my political death have been greatly exaggerated. Thank you for a historic landslide victory. Control of Congress still hanging in the balance as the vote count continues. Just hang in there a little bit longer. Keep the faith. Keep looking up. As a new chapter begins for a deeply divided country. The American people have spoken and proven once again democracy is who we are. We are going to take the House back. This is a Meet the Press election results special. Live with Chuck Todd from NBC News election headquarters in New York. We told you it'd be election week, so welcome to Overtime. Good evening and welcome to the special election results edition of Meet the Press. Polls have been closed in much of the nation for more than 24 hours now, but we still do not know which party will control either the House or the Senate in January. We may think we know a little bit about the House, but we don't yet know about the Senate. There are still millions of votes that are being tabulated. We still have a couple dozen House calls to make. And we've got three key Senate races to decide. And as you can see here, uh, our projection from the NBC News uh, decision desk has Republicans with a slight edge in the House projection wise. But at this hour, it is too close to call. So let me show you where we have. We have 33 uncalled races. Republicans have 210. They need eight more of these 33. I can tell you right now they're leading in 10 of them. Obviously, for Democrats to pull this off, they would need to win 26 of these 33. They lead in 24 of them. So right now, if you just accepted all the leads, our House uh, breakdown would be 220 Republican, 215 Democrats. Good luck, America. Meanwhile, the Senate sits on a knife's edge, and with just a handful of battleground races left in to call, uh, we still don't know who's going to be in the majority. Remember, Republicans need 51 Democrats only need 50, with Vice President Harris as a tie-breaking vote. And if either party wins both of these races, Arizona and Nevada, then the Georgia runoff is not for control. But if we get a split, which is the most likely case here, Republicans leading in Nevada, Democrats leading in Arizona, then it's deja vu all over again. We began this cycle with runoffs in Georgia, and we may end this cycle with runoffs in Georgia. Now, we do expect a batch of results from one of the few remaining Senate battlegrounds. It is Arizona, and we're already seeing some. Some of it has come in a little bit. We'll see if we can get enough to make uh, a definitive call. It's where Democratic Senator Mark Kelly is trying to hold on to his seat. We're keeping our eyes on that data, and so is the whole team behind the scenes. We did have one big Senate call today when we officially said Georgia uh, will be a runoff because we now know no candidate will hit 50 percent. We'll show you the numbers here. You can see the final tally. Um, this runoff will be December 6th, the Tuesday after the SEC title game, which Georgia, the University of Georgia expects to be in. So just keep that in mind. But this is, it looks like, the unofficial final uh, part one of this Senate race. Now, look, there's a lot we don't know from last night, but here's what we do know. Polarization was the driving force behind this election, and it helped Democrats outperform across the board despite deep voter dissatisfaction with the current president and the current economy. President Biden this afternoon held a rare and lengthy press conference on the midterm results where he answered questions about his own political future. What in the next two years do you intend to do differently uh, to change people's uh, opinion of the direction of the country, particularly as you contemplate a run for president in 2024? Nothing, because they're just finding out what we're doing. The more they know about what we're doing, the more support there is. How do you t interpret last night's results in terms of deciding whether you want to seek another term? Our, our intention is to run again. That's been our intention, regardless of what the outcome of this election was. I think everybody wants me to run, but they're going, we're going to have discussions about it. Well, as James Carville said, let's not talk about our next meal while we're still eating the current meal. So let's hold off on talking about 2024 while we finish up 2022. And in fact, I want to dive a little bit deeper into last night's results to give you an example of the power of polarization. There are two Senate races that I think help explain how party ID mattered more than any campaign you could come up with. Let me take you to the state of Ohio. Ohio was on the edge of the battleground. Tim Ryan may have run a perfect race for a Democrat in a red state. I don't think there any, anybody would deny that. You talk to any strategist in Washington, he ran an amazing race, did a much better job than Biden did of campaigning in Ohio two years earlier. And what did that mean? 
All that money and that well-run campaign, it got him 1.5 percentage points more than Biden. As you can see, the, the red-blue divide in Ohio was much stronger than a bad campaign by Vance and a good campaign by Ryan. Let me give you the, uh, an example from the other perspective. Let's go to uh, Lean Blue, Colorado. Same thing, Joe Day ran a really good race for a Republican in a blue state. He got some traction. It seemed like this was a competitive race. Obviously, Bennett here uh, got some distance, but look at this. Joe Day ran such a great campaign in Colorado that it got him 0.9 percentage points more than Donald Trump. The point is, he did run a good campaign. This is the power of polarization. All right, let's get down and find out what we're going to learn about Arizona tonight, what we're going to learn about Nevada tonight. Uh, Arizona also has a gov race. This is why we're more confident in Kelly hanging on than we are Katie Hobbs. Because I want to show you something here before we go to Vaughn Hilliard on the ground in Arizona. Check out the Blake Masters number, the raw vote, 884 there. Let me show you what the gov race is doing with Carrie Lake. She's at 940. It's been about a 50 to 60,000 vote drop off between Lake and Masters. And as you can see, it almost all goes, most of it, is sitting in that third party. So this could be essentially what almost guarantees Kelly a path to re-election, but nothing is guaranteed. Let's go down to Vaughn Hilliard in Arizona and see what he's got for us. Vaughn, what can you tell us? Yeah, we're just looking at new numbers. About 62,000 ballots just dropped here, Chuck. And I'll let you also break down these numbers here. But the big question or the big necessity, we should say, for Katie Hobbs from this batch of ballots here was that she needed to re-expand her lead here. It had shrunk down to 4,000 votes earlier in the day, but the ballots that just came out of Maricopa County, 62,000 of them, these were early ballots, mail ballots that came in over the weekend. Those were numbers that was imperative for her to perform well upon. She did just that. She beat uh, Carrie Lake among this batch of ballots by several thousand. The big question is what comes tomorrow night here? And tomorrow night's ballots, we have been told by Maricopa County, are supposed to include the same day mail ballots that individuals didn't mail back, but they instead came in and delivered them to polling locations. In 2018, Kirsten Cinema actually uh, performed well among these group of voters. But then in 2020, Donald Trump essentially switched positions with the Democrat Kirsten Cinema from 2018. So that is a big question mark. And there's about 275,000 of those outstanding ballots. So when we, when we look at the more than half a million ballots that are outstanding here in Arizona, it's those 275 mail ballots that folks walked in and hand delivered that showed when Democrat in 2018, Republican in 2020, that is the big indicator that will say whether Katie Hobbs still has a shot to be the governor right. and whether Blake Masters has a shot to be the next U.S. Senator here from Arizona. Vaughn, you know so much about the sort of reporting pattern of these mail votes after. So we've got this batch tonight. We expect a batch tomorrow. Is it the batch by the end of tomorrow that could give us a more decisive look at both of these races? It should be the indicator. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say it was a little underwhelmed by the amount of ballots that just came in. We were expecting something closer to 100,000 ballots mm -hmm. that had been indicated would have been tabulated today, but that number was just 62,000. So we're going to be going back to the Maricopa right. County here uh, with the further questions as to what to better expect tomorrow night. But we should note there is one particular candidate in all this, that being Carrie Lake, who went on stage last night and suggested that she was going to declare victory within hours. She has not done that yet, but she was already talking about cheaters and others who were behind any effort yeah. to potentially undermine her. Of course, there's no allegations or evidence of that, but there's clearly one candidate who is eager to declare victory, and that's why it would be nice to have a better indication of where this thing is headed. And Vaughn, very quickly, Carrie Lake has yet to lead in the vote count, right? Because that's the moment where she could go and declare victory. Exactly. She came within 4,000 mm -hmm. votes here. She did not appear publicly here today. Yeah. Uh, and that is uh, really for Carrie Lake. The question is, at what point right. does she claim that how does it start? And that's the issue is when you get to yeah. 4,000 and then trying to explain to the public and they use this to their advantage to try to cause discord and distrust of the system. Then suddenly when Katie Hobbs right. is now re-expanding her lead, it's confusing. But there's also reason and understanding behind all of it. All right. And I want to show there. Thank you, Vaughn Hilliard in Phoenix Force. Thank you. And let me just show show if we could point the, the camera there. She now netted about 9,000 and padded her lead by there. So that's where we're standing now. And as you can see, this is the remaining vote. It's in Phoenix, mostly. Don't assume anything out of Phoenix. It's Maricopa. It's a 50-50 county.
At this hour, we got reporters still uh, covering this midterm election across the country. We've got a panel of experts coming up, a terrific panel. But I want to go to Gary uh, Grumbach. He is in uh, Nevada for us. And let me show you where things stand in Nevada and what votes we're looking for. The real question is how many raw ballots are left in Clark County? Because that will tell us what kind of chance really. The only one that has a chance here probably is Catherine Cortez Masto. The governor may be too far behind, but Gary, you've been down there. You've been talking with the tabulators. When do we expect some new data out of both Clark County and Washoe? Yeah, we are still waiting on tens of thousands of votes to be counted here in Clark County. And I got an opportunity to go actually inside the Clark County Election Department where they are counting the votes. And you would think, given the anticipation of this race nationwide, they would be furiously counting the votes with hundreds of people there. That's not exactly what's happening inside. There's a couple dozen Clark County election workers that are very methodically opening the envelopes, putting the, uh, the ballots through the machine, and then tabulating it on their screens. It's a very methodical thing because they don't want to mess this up and they've been they don't want to be accused of messing this up and i will say this is a they're not in a real rush to get this done tonight they're not in a real mm -hmm. rush to get this done tomorrow they have <laughs> until saturday november 12th to really get this done uh, based on the same the state statute and they're not going through the night to count these things they're going to finish up sometime tonight and start back again tomorrow morning chuck and Gary, uh, do you have any insight on Washoe I want to show here? Because I don't know how a Democrat wins statewide without carrying both the two biggest counties, even if uh, narrow Washoe, one of the swingiest counties in the country. And look at this right now, Laxalt carrying Washoe, still a decent number of vote out. Our experts estimate that there's about 40,000 ballots remaining in Washoe. What are you hearing, Gary? Yeah, I think that that's accurate as well. And I want to reference our uh, colleague, John Ralston from the Nevada Independent, who was very smart on MSNBC earlier today, who was saying that there may not be enough kept votes in Washoe County to make up for what they're going to get here in Clark County. That The numbers may just not add up for the Democrats here. Uh, but it, I think what's important to note about this county, specifically in Clark County, is the culinary union's impact mm -hmm. on this race here in Clark County. Right. If you work at a casino, if you have any anything to do with a casino, you probably are a member of right. the Culinary Union, and they did a real big get-out-the-vote effort here in the state, trying to get Democrats out to vote, especially those Latino Democrats. We Go shall ahead. see Gary Grumbach on the ground force in Nevada. Gary, thank you. And if it weren't for her day job and the president's press conference today, Krista Walker would be sitting right next to me here on this Meet the Press election results special co-anchoring it. But instead, she's joining me now live from the White House North Lawn. And Kristen, you certainly uh, you certainly got your share of questions in with the president, uh, uh, both whether it was on politics or on Ukraine. But really, paint the picture here. This was an incredibly confident President Biden today, wasn't it? It absolutely was, Chuck, and uh, miss being with you there, but hello from the North Lawn. This was, I think, uh, one of the most confident tones that we have heard from President Biden. And the reason for that is because they believe, and, and clearly the results bear this out, that the red wave that they were bracing for, that they were so afraid of, never materialized. And so to some extent, it, they think this is, and the president sees this as a validation and a vindication of his policy as well as his closing message, Chuck. You and I have been talking about this. The fact that the president in the closing days talked about everything from the economy, but also abortion and threats to democracy. So now the real work begins. How does he reach across the aisle? How does he work with a Republican-led House if, in fact, Republicans do take control of the House? He seemed to indicate he didn't need to do anything differently, and I pressed him on that. Take a look at that exchange. You said you don't need to do anything differently if Republicans control the House, don't you need to recalibrate to some extent to try to work across the aisle with a Republican-led House? Well, let me put it this way. What I meant was I don't have to change any of the policies I've already passed. That's what they said they want to go after. And so what I have a simple proposition. I have a pen that can veto. 
So you heard defiance there from President oh, yeah. Biden. But look, he also, Chuck, talked about the fact that he did think that there was a, a capacity and room to work across the aisle on issues like Ukraine funding. I asked him about the fact that uh, Leader McCarthy had indicated he wasn't going to write a blank check for Ukraine. And President Biden signaling when I pressed him on that, that he's confident that funding for Ukraine will continue. And Chuck, I asked him about the fact that two thirds, according to our exit polls of Americans, say they don't want him to run again. His response to that is, watch me. Yeah, that was something else. I thought it was notable that he said, hey, we're not giving Ukraine a blank check, by the way. He was sensitive to that enough. I thought that was fascinating and a little bit of, a, of perhaps a little bit of a message to Ukraine, too, sometimes, because you hear that, that he gets frustrated that President Zelensky sometimes isn't grateful enough to what the United States is doing. Kristen, before I let you go, um, you, people have heard plenty of my takeaways. What did you learn last night? Well, I think one of the big takeaways, and this goes back to the point I was just making, which is about the president's closing argument, which included um, a focus on abortion. He said that if Democrats maintain control of both chambers, that the first piece of legislation he would introduce would be to codify Roe v. Wade. Now, of course, again, it doesn't look like Democrats are going to hold control of the House, and we wait to see what happens in the Senate in both chambers still. However, if you look at the exit polls, Chuck, it does show that there was enthusiasm around the issue of abortion. Take a look inside some of the states. Uh, this exit poll showing that 27 percent of voters nationwide cite abortion as their most important issue. And if you break it down state by state, Chuck, look at Pennsylvania. Yep. You have 37 uh, percent who said that it was the most important issue. And then in Michigan, where it was actually on the ballot, you have 45 percent. And so it, I think it's significant because we had all of this discussion about yep. whether the ship had sailed, whether that issue had yep. peaked too soon. And clearly, clearly, if you look at those exit polls, it was a factor overnight, Chuck. It was. New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, and Arizona all had abortion top cost of living. Notice what direction yes. those Senate races appear or have gone. Anyway, Kristen Welker at the White House Force. Kristen, thank you. And folks, we are still expecting a pretty big uh, addition to the vote count in Maricopa County any minute. And it could tell us which way Arizona's too early to call Senate race is leaning. I don't know if we'll get enough to be determinative on the governor's race. There's a chance on the Senate race, so don't go anywhere. My panel is next. It's a fantastic one. You're watching a special election results edition of Meet the Press. Welcome back to this Meet the Press election results special. Joining me now on our panel, we've got, uh, I think, different flavors of each party, and I mean that in a good way. Former Florida Congressman, NBC News political analyst Carlos Corbello, Simone Sanders Townsend, host of Simone on MSNBC, and a former senior advisor to Vice President Harris, former North Dakota senator and CNBC contributor Heidi Heitkamp, and former governor of North Carolina, and NBC News political analyst Pat McCrory, rural, all sorts of uh, uh, areas that we've got covered here. Welcome to all of you. Let me do a quick. We're watching Arizona Senate all the time. See if we get more vote in. We do not have any more vote in yet. But I want to show you guys something that we're all trying to figure out. How does a guy with 44 percent approval rating end up having a better than expected night? And so we isolated the people. We asked a four part question on job approval with the president. A strongly approved, somewhat approved, strongly disapproved, somewhat disapproved. The, take a look at the what were the somewhat disapprovers. It was about 10 percent of the overall electorate. Democrats won that group by four points. Let me say that again, Carlos. Democrats won people that somewhat disapproved of Joe Biden's job by four points. And look how they did it. Uh, Republicans not tied to Trump did really well with this group. Brian Kemp won a majority of these voters in, in, in Georgia. Herschel Walker did not. Let me show you Pennsylvania. In here, neither one of them won a majority of these voters, but Mehmet Oz outdid Ma uh, Doug Mastriano. Uh, let me show you New Hampshire. Chris Sununu won a majority of these people, but Don Bolda, look at that. He only won 25% of those voters. Um, Ohio. Mike DeWine won a majority of them. J.D. Vance did not. And in Wisconsin, Ron Johnson won a majority of them. 
Tim Michaels did not. Simone Sanders, what do you take away from that? So a couple things. One, that uh, people, when you, when you look at these disapproval numbers, right, it doesn't mean, as we were just kind of chatting, that people hate somebody. They don't hate Joe Biden. Joe Biden's a likable guy, you know what I mean? He's, voters went to the polls and they made a decision based on a number of different factors. In some places, abortion was an outsized factor mm -hmm. uh, that folks were making decisions about. In other places, they weren't. They aren't. In Wisconsin, I'm particularly interested in the fact that Evers came out yeah. Solid, and Mandela Barnes lost that Senate race to incumbent governor, um, Senate candidate Ron Johnson. So I think that there's a story to tell here about who came and how, and yeah. that voters made a number of different decisions when they went to that battle. Well, it's fascinating about Mandela <laughs> Barnes. You know, he only outpolled Biden, I think, in really one county, Dane County. Mm -hmm. he in Madison, where Madison yeah. is, yeah. He underperformed Biden in all those Milwaukee suburban counties, just by a couple points, but a half a percentage points decides things. Carlos, what do you make of this? Chuck, these midterm elections are supposed to be referendums on the president against generic either Republicans or Democrats, right? If the president's Republican, you're running against generic mm -hmm. Democrats. A lot of these Senate candidates especially were not generic Republicans. They were Trump acolytes and therefore it was not a referendum on Joe Biden. Yeah. It was a repeat of 2020 as you pointed out on the map. The numbers are exactly the same Almost because right those right. voters said, hold on, this is not, I don't know, substitute any of these Republicans. Right. Mehmet Oz against uh, a, a Democrat, Fetterman, this is. Joe Biden against Donald Trump. And Donald Trump is not popular. Yeah. He's a weight on Republicans. And that's why last night was a terrible night for him. So, Heidi, what should the Biden White House make of this? Here are people that disapprove but sort of bought the choice argument. Well, first off, you know, Joe Biden says it so well. Don't compare me to the almighty, compare mm -hmm. me to the alternative. And as Carlos said, when Trump went into this all in, he saw an amazing opportunity, bad economy, low favorability numbers for an existing president. He was going to be the hero. Now he's, he is really the, uh, the villain of this story and for many Republicans as well. But if you're Joe Biden, you've been around a long time. You've seen these numbers go up and down. You're also really smart. You've seen favorables, unfavorables in overall. I remember when I started in politics, you wanted to have a 60 percent favorability. I mean, that's what I used to have. Well, especially I if you're a Democrat you, in North yeah. Dakota, well, right? like you <laughs> but, need that. But, but, if you're, but, but today, you know, you feel pretty good if it's at 44. That's not unusual yeah. anymore. And so it doesn't surprise me that people differentiated mm -hmm. between Joe Biden and these other candidates. And, you know, the, the really critical thing, and I want to say this about the, the House. Everybody's talking about these narrow margins. But remember, in 2020, Nancy Pelosi thought she was going to pick up 20 seats, mm -hmm. and we lost almost 15. Yeah. And so the, the low-hanging fruit had been gone in 2020. Pat, one of the theories I had is, the questions I had about this election was, unlike Republicans in 2010 that wanted to make sure they had no association with Bush, the Bush years, or Democrats I, in 2018. I was there. Right. Or Democrats <laughs> in 2018 who said, oh, no, 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 we're not the Hillary Clinton party. We're, we're something different. Right, right. This party didn't do that. There was no new party smell, right? Where's your new car smell? There was no new party smell, and I think voters sniffed it out. Yeah, about uh, two months ago, when you thought the red wave was beginning, mm -hmm. Trump was kind of quiet in Florida. He wasn't getting a lot of publicity except from the January 7th hearing. And so you weren't hearing from him. And Biden was out there. And I was going, hot dog, come on, Mr. President, give <laughs> as many speeches as you can, stumble a little bit, make us squirm with your mistakes or whatever. And I was going, we're going to win this. And daggum, then with a week or so ago, yeah. Trump had to get on the stage and I'm coming to Pennsylvania, I'm coming to Ohio, I'm coming to North Carolina. I'm, I'm going out there whether you want me or not. In fact, I know some candidates who did not want him to come. Is there any doubt that this and hurt And they couldn't Oz? say no. Right, Is it any doubt it hurt Dr. Oz? 
I was being there at the end with Matt Strange on that stage. Yeah. It, looked, it was a terrible thing to do. But I also think there's something about the agenda here. You know, while the president may have low approval ratings, the agenda is quite popular. You talk about inf the infrastructure bill. You talk about the bipartisan gun law. Those are some of the things that candidates talked about. There were very few Democratic candidates who were in their districts yelling about Joe Biden, but they were talking about some of these issues and running mm. on the agenda. Who got kicked off the stage by Trump? DeSantis. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he did. He wasn't asked to come. Probably the best thing that ever happened to DeSantis. He worked out. It worked out. He didn't have to say no. So, so I want to say something about Warnock um, and that, that, that I found out. He took Johnny Isaacson, the, the mm -hmm. seat that he replaced, right. beloved. Johnny was like one of everybody's favorite senators. He kept that staff on and then immediately started doing constituent services, addressed uh, uh, Georgia's concern. When you go to, to Arizona, guess what? In Arizona, he talked about water, he talked about the border. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mark Kelly, and the other thing about Arizona that's interesting is why, if you're running for a seat in Arizona, do you take on the McCain family? I mean, there's no positive to that. Mm. And so at the end of the day, Jimmy and Jack got on the stage yeah. with Kelly and said he's our guy, bringing, bringing that aura, you know, that Republican moderate vote um, to, to Kelly. And Jonah Jonah that. Goldberg put it well. He said, can you imagine somebody at the Nike store yelling at a, asking customers, any of you here ever buy Adidas? Get out of the store. I don't want to sell you a Nike. Or say I hate right. Michael Jordan. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, you know, no, you want to, oh, you're, a McCain person is here. Great. I want to bring you know, it in. There is it's one point. Crazy that yeah. was. There is one point that I don't think has been stressed. A lot of this current state, the decisions were made months ago by Schumer and McConnell. Mm -hmm. Super PAC money controlled by them, which is a conflict of interest out of this world, a whole other issue. You have a personal stake in this one? <laughs> no, that's in the primary by the Club for Growth. But the super PAC money and the decision Schumer and McConnell had to make yeah. months ago predetermined who had the ground game. Now, in those states where both of them put their money, i.e. Pennsylvania, Schumer won Pennsylvania. You saw a lot of money right now in Arizona. You're seeing a lot of money in Nevada by both a lot of, money of them. In Georgia. Yep. North Carolina. Was all Democrat Schumer pulled out and left uh, uh, Beasley out cold, even though she out fundraised. Is that the one backseat driving the Democrats deserve is a whiff on North Carolina? Yeah, look, I think that the DSCC should be kicking themselves, that uh, Chuck Schumer's aligned pack should be kicking themselves. National Democrats could have done more to bolster, to bolster Sherry Beasley. There were three races where the Republicans spent millions, like millions and millions of dollars. It was Georgia, it was Pennsylvania, and the third race where they spent the most money was North Carolina against Sherry Beasley. That was a winnable race, and they would Think about it. how well she did without the help. They didn't have a Democratic yeah. ground game in North Carolina. The Republicans yeah. had a ground game because of state Supreme Court justice race. Too. Interesting. Well, yeah, Democrats did not do well on the judges in no, North Carolina. That was Boy, the they, they, race they, in North Carolina. We, we, we're gonna, we might get off on a tangent there, and we shouldn't, <laughs> but I hear you on that. In fact, by the way, guess what's coming up in about three months in the state of Wisconsin? The judges race Another Supreme Another state Court, Supreme Court judges it? race. Exactly. All right. Let me pause this conversation here a little bit. You guys have to stick around because you promised you would. I want to bring in, though, my next guest. Despite a better than expected night, voters still sent a clear message to the party in power that they're not satisfied with the handling of some key issues, particularly the economy. So to help us break down everything we saw from Democrats last night, New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy. He is currently the vice chair of the Democratic Governors Association. And, Governor, I really wanted to talk to you because, you know, this we got our first check in on this cycle about one year ago. And you were the one going, oh, my God, what almost happened to me in blue New Jersey? When you think about where the perception of the Democratic Party was and where things were a year ago and where you are the morning after this midterm. Are you surprised at where Democrats are today? No, I'm not. Chuck, good to be with you. I think we were in many respects the canary in the coal mine, as they say, uh, with, I think, affordability with the inflation rates now only intensifying. Mm -hmm. Listen, I, I think all things considered, and I know the House is still in the balance, the Senate's still in the balance. We got several governor's races still in the balance. Um, I, I'll tell you something. I think we learned some lessons uh, and we got our points across in a way that exceeded expectations. We had great candidates, great incumbents. I know the governor's race is the best, 
But no question, we learned lessons from a year ago. Might have taken us a while to apply them. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, for the most part, we did. I heard an interesting stat so far. I think so far, there's only been one statewide Democratic incumbent to lose, and it was the Attorney General of Iowa. Um, there hadn't been, you didn't lose an incumbent governor. That doesn't mean you might not. We don't know. No. Sisolak yet. That still could happen. But you said there's some lessons. So give me one. What did you take away? But by the way, Chuck, and this is pending Steve's race, obviously, but uh, the DGA is very proud of the fact they haven't lost an incumbent since 2014. Um, I, here, here are things I took away. Finally, our party is quite famously lousy on a coherent, specific message. I think we got there. And the good news is we had a substantive story to tell when you look at the historic uh, bills that were passed in Congress and signed and led by the president. So we had a substantive story. We finally told that story. Secondly, I think uh, Roe v. Wade or Dobbs uh, was a latent issue, maybe not showing up in polling in some of these races, but it was in the back of folks' mind uh, and it impacted a lot of decisions uh, in, in terms of voting. I think thirdly, the democracy craziness finally took hold uh, and Listen, crime is out there. The Republicans play that card really well. It feels like they do it every couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, but they didn't, they didn't play the card that says, what are we going to do about it nearly as well? And I think records uh, sort of won out on that basis. New Jersey, for instance, we've got a significant, uh, in, uh, significant decrease in violent crimes. Folks were able to make that case. So it's a, a combination of a number of things. Are you at all concerned that... Trump papers over issues inside the Democratic Party. I mean, Donald Trump has now been the gift to Democrats in 18, the gift to Democrats in 20, and now the gift to Democrats in 22. What happens if Republicans sober up and kick their Trump habit? Yeah, Chuck, I'm, I'm not holding my breath. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm, I'm scratch, I've been scratching my head since yeah, at least 2016, have. if not earlier, uh, why that hasn't happened. And there were some good... Uh, strong, reasonable Republicans out there. I'm close to several of the governors, uh, uh, a Larry Hogan or a Charlie Baker. These are good guys. Uh, but for whatever reason, their voice, that, that lane of that party is not the in vogue lane. Um, and uh, as long as that's the case, we're not going to be bashful about calling out the, uh, the, the extremism, the, the, mm -hmm. the absolute insanity of the wing that is unfortunately more often than not in vogue. What do you make of Tom Malinowski's loss in your state? Um, it was a rematch with Tom Kane Jr. Obviously, Tom Kane Jr. certainly has some name ID in the state, given his father was governor, held the same position you do. What's your take on that race? And is there anything that you take away that says, you know, Democrats ought to be careful about X, Y, or Z here? Yeah, it's a tough loss. Two good guys. Uh, Tom Kane's father is one of my mentors. Malinowski's an outstanding congressman and a big loss. I first heard his name associated with human rights from John McCain, of all people, when I was finishing up as U.S. ambassador in Germany. Um, he had a tough, on the margin, a tough redistricting. That was part of it. Um, and some very spe specific particular issues to his, uh, yeah, to that, to that race. Issues. Yeah. Um, I don't think there are, are, are broad, okay. overarching lessons for the party. Uh, at first blush, we're still looking at it, but he's a good man. We haven't seen the last of him. You uh, enthusiastic about Biden 2024? Yeah, I think he's going to go and I'm going to support him. I've said that to him privately and publicly. I think if you're the president, you got to look at yesterday through all the, the fog of mm -hmm. weak poll numbers and message challenges that our party have had. You have to say, you know what? He's had a heck of a run here. Uh, and the voters have realized that, and they're giving our party credit for it. You can't, can't help but... but You're not one of these Democrats that says, uh, are, are, that's questioning whether he's the strongest possible nominee? No. He's the leader of our party. Mm -hmm. He says he's running. I take him on his word, and I'm going to be with him, assuming he does, a thousand percent. Governor Phil Murphy, Democrat from New Jersey, vice chair of the Democratic Governors Association. And I caught your stat there. Uh, we'll see what happens in Nevada, but undefeated in protecting incumbents since 2014. 
Um, Keep me in your prayers, Chuck. We'll, we'll see what happens in Clark County, sir. All right, yeah. thank you. We're back on the ground, live reporting on some of the last night's biggest winners after the break. But first, a look at some of the history-making election results in Florida. Meet the first Gen Z member of Congress, 25-year-old Maxwell Frost will be coming to Congress. He is from Central Florida and Massachusetts. Maura Healy will make history as the state's first female governor and the country's first openly lesbian governor, although she's going to be joined by Oregon's governor, I believe, on that front as well. In Maryland, Democrat Wes Moore will be elected the state's first African-American governor. And in Arkansas, Republican Sarah Huckabee Sanders will be elected as the state's first female governor. She's also a millennial. Wes Moore and Sarah Sanders, the millennial governors. Keep an eye on both of them in the next few quadrennial cycles. You're watching a special election results edition of Meet the Press. Welcome back. Let's turn now to some of the big winners in these midterm elections so far for Democrats. John Fetterman, still recovering from a stroke during the campaign, defeated Mehmet Oz to pick up Pennsylvania Senate seat for Democrats. I think one of the biggest winners on the Democratic side was Governor Gretchen Whitmer. She had a really strong night. She propelled Democrats to win control of the Michigan House, Michigan Senate, first time in nearly 40 years. And oh, by the way, she helped get that constitutional amendment on abortion rights on the ballot as well. Pretty big win for her. But the biggest winner in either party last night had to be in Florida, Republican Governor Ron DeSantis' uh, uh, de just amazing re-election victory over Democrat Charlie Crist. It wasn't surprising that he won. It was the margin by which he won by. Ali Vitale's in Tampa, which was supposed to be the home area of Charlie Crist. Uh, Governor DeSantis grew up around there as well. He celebrated last night there in Pittsburgh. There's Dasha Burns who's been covering the Pennsylvania Senate race all year long. And also with me in Detroit is my colleague, Yamiche Alcindor, who spoke with Governor Whitmer this morning. But let me start down in Florida and Tampa with Ron DeSantis. And look, by the last two months of this campaign, their whole goal was to run up the score here. He wanted to get to 60. He's going to come up just short, but it's still pretty impressive. Yeah, nevertheless, mission accomplished, right, Chuck? I mean, you and I, whenever I come to Florida for elections, because I did 2018 down here the first time that Ron DeSantis ran for governor, I got stuck here for an extra two weeks because of automatic recount rules because his race was within 0.4%. So sign of the times, the fact that he went from 0.4% when it was him versus Andrew Gillum in 18 versus now where he's up 19 points in his reelection victory, it's why people are talking about this as such an obvious springboard if he wanted to run for president in 2024. It's clear when you listen to Donald Trump that Trump thinks that he wants to pres run for president <laughs> in 2024. He's given out nicknames, which more than anything else, nicknames aside, it just puts in the public eye the private schisms that I have been hearing about and that you've probably been hearing about too for months. The fact that Trump is irked by DeSantis, the way that he's viewed within the Republican Party right now as a Trump heir apparent. Every time I go to conservative gatherings, whether mm -hmm. it's CPAC, other Republican in gatherings across the country. They do these straw polls. If Trump is in them, he leads them. But if he's out of them, DeSantis is usually the first name on the list by a long shot. So the fact that Trump is paying attention to him, donors are paying attention to him, Republican operatives I'm talking about are paying attention to him, there's really going to be a lot of focus on what does DeSantis do next. And the thing that I think of is Charlie Chris tried to get him to commit to a four-year term here during this one gov yeah. gubernatorial debate. He would not commit to that. And last night, there were a chance yeah. of two more years, yeah. not four more years, Chuck. I, I caught that. That was interesting. By the way, for those wondering about what happened to Democratic turnout, a half a million fewer votes total uh, in the governor's race yeah. this year from four years ago. Population grew in Florida and fewer people showed up. I think it's pretty clear Democrats stayed home in Florida. Anyway, Ali Vitale in Florida. Yeah. Ali, thank you. Let's move to Pennsylvania. Dasha Burns. Is there? Uh, this has been quite the road. I think the fascinating thing here with this yeah. race, our exit poll caught it. What was the worst sin uh, to the voters? Was it Fetterman's health or was it Oz not being from the state? And by a narrow margin, it was Oz not being from the state. 
Yeah, Chuck, I really thought that when we would be talking tonight that we would still be waiting for those results. Last night when we were at Betterman headquarters, the campaign, the media there, we were all ready to buckle down for at least a couple of days here. The race was called so much earlier than we were expecting. And look at the end of the day, when the results were announced, the crowd behind me at Fetterman HQ was chanting every county, every vote. That was the Fetterman mantra from the beginning. That was their strategy. He went to those places here in this state that Democrats haven't visited in a long time. Places where folks have felt abandoned by the Democratic Party, rural areas, union areas, blue collar areas. And he, from the beginning, has thought that with his brand, with his approach, the sort of authenticity, the uh, sweatshirt and gym shorts that he brought to uh, his sort of approach to being a politician, the not your typical politician brand, would help win those voters over. And he did sort of eat into those margins. Uh, he outperformed Biden in those counties. He also outperformed yep. Biden in some of those blue counties in Philly and the collar counties uh, in those suburban areas that Oz was trying to compete in as well. So at the end of the day, the approach worked. We also saw a huge win in the governor's race here, Shapiro winning by a massive, massive margin. Democrats had been hoping that he might be able to help pull Fetterman over the finish line. That could have been a factor as well. And Chuck, you and I talked on Sunday about that rally that Oz had with Trump and Doug Mastriano, whom Republicans here had been telling me for months now is too extreme, too far yeah. to the right. Um, that could have potentially had an impact as well as Oz was trying to carve out that moderate lane for himself. Doesn't look so moderate when you're standing on stage uh, with those guys. So a huge, huge yeah. win for Democrats here. Their best chance to pick up yeah. a Senate seat. And, and they did it. And I'll tell you this, Tasha, his lead is only going to grow because there's still a quarter of the vote out in Philadelphia. So this lead is only going to grow. He may end up winning this race by five percentage points when all is said and done. Dasha Burns, uh, I will say it again, just a terrific job covering this race. Um, ignore the arrows. Thank you, Dasha. Let me move over to Yamiche Alcindor, who uh, is in Michigan. She was monitoring Michigan a lot. You talked to Governor Whitmer today. I'll tell you, if it wasn't Ron DeSantis, the next person who had probably the best night individually was Gretchen Wimmer. She's a two-term governor, one of the most important battleground states. She won her state legislature. You know, if there were an opening for president, she would be at, uh, one, in the top tier of Democrats sitting there, wouldn't, wouldn't she? Certainly. And when we think about this, um, Democrats here in Michigan, they, in some ways, they're echoing the feeling that Democrats across the country are feeling, which is that they had a better than expected election night. And Democratic Governor Gretchen Wimmer, of course, as you said, she was successful in her bid to win re-election. She had focused her closing message on abortion, and that worked out very well for her. her she beat out her opponent, Republican Tudor Dixon, who was campaigning against abortion and saying that inflation was the top issue. But when you look at exit polls, abortion was the number one issue here for Michigan voters. Now, I sat down with Gretchen Whitmer, and she told me that she really believes that Proposal 3 passing here, which was that amendment to enshrine abortion rights into the state constitution in Michigan, that it really signals that voters, her message really resonated with voters, and it also shows that people, she said, don't want to go backwards when it comes to rights. People don't want to get rights taken away, and that, that, she said, is not only related to abortion rights, but also LGBTQ rights. Now, when you talk about her sort of the political states, I did ask her, um, what's next for you? Because I'm going to tell you, um, Chuck, she was keeping somewhat presidential campaign hours. I saw her on stage at about midnight, then I was, she was back on it at 8 a.m. And I told her, ma'am, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get some sleep here and you were just at it. But really what she was saying was that she's eager to have future, have the future of Michigan on her mind. And she was eager to talk to voters, eager to talk to the people who were in some ways were very nervous about whether or not this proposal was going to pass. So what I felt and saw here was yeah. really a lot of elation from Governor, Whit from Governor Whitmer and a lot of people saying, voters in particular say they feel like their state is really speaking for them here. You know, it's something interesting in case you're wondering, you know, I told you in Florida, fewer people voted. In Michigan, we had uh, nearly a 5% increase in the raw vote between 18, her first victory, and now you have to wonder, maybe it's the constitutional amendment uh, or, or other things, but that uh, worth noting there. Yamish, thank you. So, let's get back to our terrific panel here. House control hasn't been called, but our political unit crunched the numbers, and Democrats are going to have to almost run the table in order to get control. So right now we have those 33 uncalled House races. Democrats would have to win 26 of them. Republicans only need eight. Right now they lead in 10. 
I got Carlos Corbello back, Simone Sanders Townsend, Heidi Heitkamp, Pat McCrory. Carlos, you served in Congress. A 220 to 215 Republican majority. What does that look like? And can either party elect a speaker under that scenario? Here's some perspective. 2015, 248 House Republicans. John Boehner leaves because the House Republican Conference is not governable with 248. Yeah, that's a 28 more members Two, than what we're talking no, about now. The, the most members they had since the Great Depression, and Boehner couldn't do it. <laughs> Paul Ryan comes in. He does a little better. You know, Paul was at, at a better temperament and, and, and you know, more patient. But he struggled with about 240 members. Kevin McCarthy might have 222, 220. Kevin McCarthy tried to become speaker in 2015 and couldn't get the votes with 248 House Republicans. I'm obsessed with the so Indiana you tell Jones. Me what's gonna yeah, happen. I'm obsessed with Indiana Jones and the Holy Grail one. That's always been my favorite Indiana Jones. Oh, and one and more remember, thing. you're like, touching the Grail. You're trying to get it, and Sean Connery says, "Let it go, son." I, don't you want to say that to poor Kevin McCarthy at this point? Let it go, son. Hey, you're yeah. Yeah. You're in it once. One more thing. Matt Gates tweeted today, Speaker Jordan. Oh my goodness. So, Kevin's oh, got to Lord. deal with that. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Simone Sanders, let's talk about uh, what... I want to get it, what each party should constructively take away here, getting into 24. Look, you don't want to ever show weakness, but what would you constructively tell the Democrats to learn from this? Well, a, a positive would be mm -hmm. that young people, if you talk to them, they do vote, okay? And election day, too. They showed up uh, on, on election, election day. day. In places where, again, polling places were accessible, mm -hmm. where there was targeted efforts for them. Uh, young voters, they made a difference for Democrats in so election. So spend some money and do spend it. Spend some money yeah. and do that. Pers again, persuadable voters. I think mm -hmm. the base are persuadable voters. You have to treat them as such. So that means Latinos, uh, black voters black men, Latino men specifically. I also think, though, that um, this conventional wisdom about how salient was or was not the issue of abortion, it was a very salient issue. But why did so many races and so many strategists say that it was not? Now, there were Democrats. This was an internal oh, Democrats. The Sanders, yes. But Bernie Sanders was the leading. Yes, the my leading, former boss got up yeah, there and no, was, he was like, the they shouldn't be doing it. Critique they shouldn't be this, doing yeah. it. That's my Bernie Sanders impression. Yeah. But yeah, it, it was wrong. And so let's say some introspection. But this is not a, look, I think that there are a lot of Democrats out there like saying, look, this is a mandate. Blah, blah, blah. The Democrats are potentially going to lose the House. I said last night, I said today, I'll say this morning, we woke up to headlines that said no red wave, cliffhanger. Mm -hmm. That was good. That was a good morning, good night right. for Democrats. Really good morning for Joe Biden. But there is something going on here. We have to figure out how we can talk to more people, yeah. register more voters, bring more folks into the tent and stay focused on the issues and not let the Republican Party try to crime us yeah. into oblivion. Because, again, it is not they're They're not being um, honest, really, about the issue. All right, Heidi, I'm going to sort of push you on this a little bit. You know, can the. I look at the 2024 Senate map, mm -hmm. and it's got th three people jump out at me, right? You've got our Tester. friend Mr. Tester here, you got Mr. Manchin here, and then you got Mr. Mr. Brown there, right? That's well, Red and State. And don't forget cinema. And then there's cinema. Uh, we'll talk about the cinema thing in a minute. <laughs> but um, how does this, this Democratic Party looks like they didn't know how to win those places? How you do know, they win it in two years? But, but, but that was true even when, they lo when, when I lost and Claire lost and Donnelly lost in 18. They won yeah. in 18. And 18 was not any easier than, than this midterm and for, for uh, uh, Democratic uh, Senate candidates. And so well, it was Trump a suburban played, wave, but yeah. you didn't have enough suburban right, right, vote right. in North Dakota. And, and, and yeah. I always say, you know, John Tester gets an advantage because it's not a purple state it leans green it's very environmental and yeah. so he can pick up that youth vote that environmental vote Joe Manchin is a is a person all to himself and let me tell you Sherrod Brown believes in working people and they know him and so they've all been able to brand themselves separate from the Democratic Party now whether they run again yeah. I think is the real challenge here yeah. but but to me I, I want to go back to the Fetterman uh, mm -hmm. Example, you know, Fetterman outperformed Joe Biden in rural Pennsylvania. Yeah, we're now, showing he didn't her, win. Some, of the, we're he didn't showing her win. some of these numbers right. here. Beaver's one of my he, favorite counties to use. This yeah. used to be a Dem county. And he, he, had, he, he didn't win those counties, but he is doing what we need to do, which is not lose so badly. And the other message I think that's critical here is don't believe your own rhetoric. 
-hmm. Don't drink your own Kool-Aid. <laughs> you think that it was your economic message? It was Trump and abortion and chaos <laughs> that was on the ballot, and they said no more of that. Right. We won't have that advantage if Trump steps off. All right, I don't know if you're the right person to ask this, but how do you dump Trump? Because the Republican <laughs> Party has to. If they want to be a majority party, they have not been able to get 50% of anything, not 50% of the popular vote, since Donald Trump's been leader of this party. Well, I know the Trump voter. They've been with me and they've been against me. Yeah. But I know behind the scenes when you meet the Trump voter, they go, I like this DeSantis. But they're afraid to say it mm -hmm. because the Trump people don't want to tell another Trump person they're against him. And I think you're going to see just that like, with the Democratic like congressional Party. Republicans. <laughs> right, they all they can't stand this stuff, but they won't oh, say but, anything. But I think, no, I think they will come out. I think, going back to the silent majority of... Richard Nixon. I think they will come out and go, President Trump, it's time for you to step aside. And it's going to take someone like uh, DeSantis to go, I want to make the move like Obama made the move when my opening is there and not sit on the sideline. And I, I expect him to do it. And Governor, what happens when Trump says, I'm taking my coalition? I'm taking all those I'm people that I brought, mm. the white, the, the blue collar, <clears throat> working class folks, the, the people who will go to their rallies, and I'm going to hold you yeah. hostage. Because the reason why the Republic, they don't love Donald Trump, but the reason why they've tolerated him is he brought new people to the party okay. and carried them forward. And so what happens if Donald Trump says, they're coming with me, they're loyal That's to me, not to the Republican these primaries. Party. I mean, exactly. Oh, yeah. me, I was in one of those primaries, <laughs> but I'm just telling you, to say Santos has that special poll. I hear he you I, I, I have visited his rural areas. I was just going to say, can Ron I remind? DeSantis I'm going to remind you. That man has uh, not seen nothing outside Florida. Right after the 2014, right after the 2014, right after the 2014 <laughs> midterm elections, there was a, a governor in Wisconsin <laughs> named Scott Walker who just won his third statewide race in four years yeah. at the fun. time, right? Good and he had beat the recall and Every Republican went, that's the guy for 16. That's the guy. And then he went out there, and he wasn't a guy. And I don't know. You know Ron DeSantis a little bit, Carlos. You served with him a little bit. I think he looks good standing next to Trump. Will he look good when Trump isn't standing next to, you know, proverbially standing Jeff next to Trump? Bush. The, the big is Jeff question Bush? is, how does DeSantis hold up on a debate stage when Donald Trump is punching him in the face over and over and over again. There are some comparisons between Ron DeSantis and Jeb Bush. They're, they're both policy people. They're, you know that question of who would you rather have a beer with? They're, they're, they're not really at the top of that list. You know, Trump, for all his I'm flaws, he's entertaining. I'm interesting. Jeb Bush. Jeb Bush would have never had a beer with Jeb Bush. Jeb Bush. 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 Jeb Bush. 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 Yeah. Right. Yeah. Jeb Bush would have never gone after Disney. This oh, no, guy, no, no. this not, guy. I'm, this, I'm talking about personality. Oh, I understand. Yeah. And, I understand. And obviously Donald Trump got the better of Jeb Bush on the debate stage. And if you notice, even Trump backed off the name calling a day after he did it. And that means he got some pushback. That, that, that and means that's rare. That, does, he, does he put off his announcement? Can you talk him out of the announcement until after Herschel Walker? Well, the AP is saying that that's I what people are trying to do. He shouldn't have did it in the first oh, place. But I'm no, I'm no former Republican uh, strategist. Donald Trump. <laughs> and, uh, I don't listen, go to Democrats to find out Republican. Exactly, I don't go to Republican exactly. to find exactly. a Democrat. Donald probably. Trump needs to change the subject. Last night was a disaster yeah. for yeah. him. Ron DeSantis surged. Yeah. Yeah. I think he has to do it because he's got to change. How many times Democrats have we gonna... buried Donald Trump and he's resurrected himself? I, I, no, and I'm so wrong. anyone who thinks that it, last night is last chapter yeah. in the Donald Trump story I, has not paid can attention. Can we say something about the general election for a second? Everybody right. wants to talk well, about I, Ron DeSantis. And I got about you got thirty. Seconds. Everyone wants to talk about Ron DeSantis, but I have won some won some presidential races and I have lost some primaries, <laughs> honey. And you have to be able a general election electorate me is a coalition of different people okay mm -hmm. Donald Trump for all his stuff he won some suburban women Ron DeSantis doing that stuff he does in Florida I don't think right. moderate it, folks he, he, got, he got 60% go. right. that's a coalition I don't have special. much time uh, we've been sitting here honestly waiting for some Arizona vote and we didn't get any more Arizona vote that doesn't mean it won't keep coming in you should keep track of it but we got a little bit not enough to move things here again you'd rather be Mark Kelly, then Blake Masters. Question is, would you rather be Carrie Lake right now than Katie Hobbs? Katie Hobbs, the first 
uh, count here did allow her to span her lead, but we are sitting on a knife's edge on that governor's stop race. Stop the count. Stop the count. They listen to Heidi I came. She wants to stop the count. No, I All don't. All right. I, she's teasing. She's teasing. Uh, Carlos Cabello, Simone Sanders Townsend, Heidi Heitkamp, and Pat McCrory, you guys were terrific. Thank you. Thank you for being with us, all of you, this hour for this Meet the Press election results special. We're pretty proud of what we've done here at NBC News all week long. Uh, a terrific team. My political unit has been amazing. Uh, the entire Meet the Press staff. And we have more to go and more votes to count. We'll have more midterm coverage tomorrow. Meet the Press Now at 4 o'clock on NBC News Now. We'll see you then. <laughs> Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.